Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Yassine Qureshi. I'm a first year double majoring in economics and Middle Eastern studies. Uh, I also serve the IOP as an event ambassador and a member of our Leaders of Color cohort. Uh, it is my honor today to welcome you to our latest event of the IOP Speaker Series program, a discussion with US Trade Representative Catherine Tai on our career path, as well as her take on the nature of free trade agreements and the future of our global trading system. As you may know, Ambassador Tai is no stranger to trade policy. A couple years after earning a BA from Yale and a JD from Harvard Law, Ambassador Tai served as Chief Counsel for China Trade Enforcement under the Trade Representative's Office. Soon after, she litigated trade cases at the World Trade Organization and formally moved on to the House Ways and Means Committee. In her role as Chief Trade Counsel, Ambassador Tai played a pivotal role in renegotiating the U.S.-Canada-Mexico agreement while advocating for stronger labor provisions. She currently serves as the 19th U.S. Representative and is the Principal Advisor of Trade Policy in President Biden's Cabinet. The moderator of our discussion today is Bethany McLean, contributing editor for Vanity Fair, uh, as well as columnist at Yahoo Finance and contributor for CNBC. Uh, before we get into their discussion, I'd like to ask that you please keep your phone silenced for the duration of the event. When it's time for Q&A, our ambassadors will place a microphone uh, in the audience with first priority for questions given to our students. Also, please keep an eye out for our next two IOP events, Church and State, Christianity and American Politics in 2024, right here at the same time on Thursday. And who votes in 2024? Literally half the world. Our event on upcoming international elections next Tuesday at 5.30 at the Keller Center. But without further ado, I'd like to encourage you all to give a warm U Chicago welcome to Ambassador Tai and Bethany McLean. to start with a really basic question. How is trade policy different in the Biden administration than it's been in past administrations? And why is it important that it's different? Certainly. This is a really good question because um, thank you for seeing us. It is different in this administration and that's very much by design. We're trying to change the way that the United States conducts trade policy uh, and because you can't do trade by yourself, it's inherently something that you have to do with others. Uh, how we can collectively take new approaches to trade policy around the world. Um, if I were to break this down for you, what I would say is uh, for many, many years, I would say you know, from the post-World War II era uh, to the very recent past, um, we have collectively uh, built out a multilateral trading system and trading culture, if you will, that is based on a very noble premise that the more countries and economies trade with each other, the more interdependent they become, the more efficient they become, with this global economy, and the more prosperity and peace there will be. And I think if you look at the history of the last several decades, you will see a tremendous amount of prosperity that has been generated. Do you look at um, GDP data? You see it growing by leaps and bounds in the global context. Uh, and then we have also had mm, long periods of peace. In these most recent years, we have started to see many aspects of this premise challenged. So I think that uh, if you want to go back to um, uh, 2016, if you will, there were two votes that rocked the world in 2016, uh, one in the UK and one here in the United States. And they both challenged conventional wisdom about what was going to happen. And they both had within them a common theme of a pushing back against this trend of integration and globalization, if you will. Since then, we've also experienced very, very disruptive and personally for many of us traumatic global pandemic which came with um, 
uh, an economic upheaval and supply chain disruptions. And the supply chains were so disrupted that we now all talk about supply chains as a matter of course. When I think in the pre-pandemic area, they were trade nerds and maybe uh, logistics experts who were the ones who primarily talked about supply chains. Then um, in uh, uh, 2022, we had the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So do you remember, I think for a long time, uh, the truism was, uh, no two countries that had McDonald's's in them go to war with each other, had ever gone to war with each other. Uh, there are McDonald's, there were McDonald's's in both Russia and Ukraine. And so that peace and prosperity um, premise really was exploded. Then you've got uh, an increasing urgency around an increasingly obvious climate crisis. And then you have this digital transformation and technological advancement that is uh, uh, catching us uh, by, by surprise in terms of the speed and the significance and consequence for our daily existence and also for our economic development. You take all of these things together, I think it is very clear to us that our trade policies have to adapt they have to evolve, and they have to serve the purpose of resilience, sustainability, and more inclusive outcomes. What are you up against in trying to enact change? In other words, is trade policy something that is fluid and flexible and people are open to debate, or is trade policy hardened? So I think in concept, trade policy, like any policy, uh, is what we make of it. So um, in terms of trying to advance change, um, it is absolutely possible and it is happening. But I think what you're getting at with your question is, is there resistance to this conversation and this desire to change and evolve? And there absolutely is. I think that in a certain sense, change is hard, change is uncomfortable, change is scary, change may affect existing business models. Change may affect existing understandings of um, uh, what works and what doesn't. And so absolutely, uh, there is a lot of resistance. But um, uh, I think that the fact of the matter is there is so much change going on around us, whether we want it or not, that in terms of being policymakers, the path to success really lies in embracing the change. And then the challenge for us is to articulate where we're trying to guide the change and whether we have a positive vision for the change. Before we come back to change, how did you become a trade nerd? Oh, uh, this is a great question. Um, a little bit by well, I want to say a little bit by accident, and I was talking to a group of students before uh, to let them know that when I was in college, what I really wanted to be was a writer. And uh, I'm not a writer right now. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's, uh, I think it's really informed by my own personal journey. Um, I was a history major in college um, because I think history is really important. History is the telling of stories. This is the telling of stories about ourselves. So history is really critical to our understanding of ourselves and mm, our envisioning of our futures. Um, when I graduated college, I realized that um, learning history in a lecture hall or in a seminar from books um, uh, is really important. Uh, but what I wanted to do was to experience history. So um, I applied for and received a fellowship to teach English in China. This is the mid to late 1990s, where this was one of the only, one of the only ways uh, that um, a college grad uh, could get to China and experience what life was like there. And uh, at the time, I thought, uh, well, um, China is less developed. There's a lot happening there, I will learn a lot. And boy, did I learn a lot. 
um, I probably, uh, my English probably um, uh, got worse, while I hope my students' English got better. Uh, but I learned that I, I love to teach. Um, I saw around me so much economic development, the pursuit of economic opportunity by so many people around me. And I'll just tell you, I grew up in the, the, the Maryland suburbs of Washington, DC, in a very kind of middle class existence. Um, and uh, as a 22 year old, 24 year old, I thought, uh, this is really boring. Uh, I'd like to see what life is like where um, you're living closer to the bone. I was young, I was young a person. And uh, when I got to China, I was living in South China, Guangzhou, the uh, capital of Guangdong province. It is the epicenter of um, uh, Deng Xiaoping's initial and original um, economic experiments, a special economic zone there. And what I found was all around me, people who were pushing themselves and each other to achieve a kind of middle-class dream. And I started to appreciate how important economic development is to the sense of economic opportunity. And that it made me appreciate better my own middle-class upbringing and the suburbs of Washington, DC. Um, but it also made me understand that uh, there is a commonality to what people want uh, and perhaps what governments can help to provide. I think that's really interesting. There's this tendency to see the economy as something that exists outside of human life, but in fact, the economy is human life. I think we saw that in the pandemic. Uh, speak, speaking of which, this notion of resilience that became very important in the pandemic, how, do you, uh, how does that juxtapose with the push toward profit maximization that has been so key, so, so prevalent in American business over the past couple of decades? How do those two ideas coexist? So I love that you're asking me this question here at the University of Chicago, because this is, this is the, the birthplace and the epicenter of the Chicago School. Right? So um, I think that that push for trade liberalization has also become a push for um, uh, efficiency maximization, profit maximization, cost minimization. And uh, uh, under that push, you have developed a set of uh, trade rules and institutions that have um, uh, rewarded behavior for cutting costs, um, for uh, pushing production to the lowest cost jurisdictions. Um, and uh, what we have discovered is that production and supply a lot of it has moved out of the United States. We have certainly experienced a, a deindustrialization over the last many decades. Uh, and uh, production and supply pooling and becoming concentrated in certain parts of the world where there are uh, natural cost advantages and maybe also artificial cost advantages. And when this system then hit the disruptive force of the pandemic, what we discovered was that this system was not built for resilience and that we had catastrophic failures happening across the global economy. So the question fundamentally that we want to pose is, how do we do trade policy differently? If we were a part of the problem in terms of creating an incentive structure that uh, rewarded this kind of efficiency maximization and the, the fragility of global supply chains, how can we become a part of the solution? How do we incentivize decision makers in the economy to consider not just efficiency, and don't throw efficiency out, efficiency is also important, but resilience so that in future, when we come up against these crises, we don't experience the same kind of catastrophic failure, that we have systems and supply chains and production lines that can bounce back more quickly. Is that doable? 100%. I don't see why it's not doable. Okay, I 
hope, I hope you're right. So you have talked about the importance of workers, and you address the largest US labor federation, um, talking about this idea that workers will be at the center of the administration's economic plans. And you've talked about how too many communities were left behind with the trade policy that we've pursued in, in the past. What would you have done differently if you could go back to those days? It's a great question, and I think we could probably spend an entire <laughs> semester talking about it. I think what I might do is just short circuit that conversation because it doesn't really matter to this, to, to, to this extent that we can't, there is no time machine that we can go in to go back and do things differently. Yeah. Um, and and I, th I think that there are a lot of questions about um, what if we had made different decisions along the way? We didn't. And I think that there were a lot of well-meaning people for, for honorable reasons um, who made decisions that are what they are. I think that the, the question for us today is, um, why are we putting workers at the center of our trade policies? And the answer to that is because um, we've not really done it before. And what we've seen around us is that it is something that it is, that it is right for us to do. It is something that we should do. And to your point about um, thinking about the economy as, as um, uh, something other than a set of numbers and economic indicators. Um, the economy is the economy is all of you. The economy is people, and people participate in the economy. Yes, as consumers, but also as producers, as business owners, as innovators and entrepreneurs, but fundamentally also as workers. That in order to consume you're probably also working and earning a wage. So uh, you mentioned that uh, I've addressed the um, largest uh, confederation um, uh, of uh, organized labor, uh, AFL-CIO, my first year. I gave a speech on worker-centered trade. Um, in my second year as USTR, uh, I was invited to address uh, the Steelworkers Union at their annual convention. Uh, that was an experience I will never forget. Why? Uh, it was in person, it was the first in person convention I think that they'd had since the pandemic disruption. It was in Las Vegas because you've got those big, big, big hotels that turn into convention halls. And uh, I, got to, I got to talk to hundreds if not thousands of steel workers about a vision for how America can do trade that cuts them a better deal and a good deal. And uh, I'll share with you, there is a, a call and response moment. This is maybe um, before I got on the stage, where this is a steelworker tradition, as I've learned. And the question is, whose union is this? And the entire membership responds, it's everybody's union. And I, I think that was so incredibly moving for me to hear, because that is actually, that underlies our entire agenda for advancing a new trade agenda, which is we want trade policies that cut everybody in on a better deal. Um, I'll just uh, highlight one more uh, of my uh, um, proud moments in terms of uh, placing workers at the center of our trade agenda. Um, earlier uh, in May of 2023, uh, as part of the United States APEC host year, I hosted um, the trade ministers from the APEC member economies in Detroit for our meeting. And uh, it was shortly after the United Auto Workers had elected a new president, Sean Fain. Um, he was in the process of um, uh, putting in his team. Um, and uh, we, we worked and worked and worked and worked to um, uh, invite him to come to our meeting of trade ministers from the Asia Pacific to talk about what trade has meant for him personally, for him as the leader of the auto workers. And um, he did, he came, he came with the secretary treasurer of the AFL-CIO and um, I, uh, I uh, created an opportunity for trade ministers from around the Asia Pacific to hear directly from our labor leaders about why trade is important to them and why they need us to have a new trade policy. And I, I, it was tremendously, it was a tremendous honor for me because I can talk about a worker-centered trade policy until I'm blue in the face, which I do often, by the way. 
but it offers me that affirmation and credibility to um, share with my fellow trade ministers uh, an audience with one of our labor leaders so that they can hear for themselves and start thinking about um, uh, what their workers might share with ours and how we can do trade together differently. So your description of the call and response gave me a little bit of a chill because I grew up in a mining town in northern Minnesota that has been very much affected by, by all of these policies. I want to come back to the issue of, of, how, of how we get this right, but I want to back up a little bit because I think that that discussion involves China to, to, to a big degree. And I'd like to, to once again broaden out and start with some people, even Trump haters, will give him some credit for tackling, for beginning to tackle the issue of what we do about China. Um, I think you described it as um, a switch to a different par a paradigm mm -hmm. of unilateral U.S. pressure to try to change Be Beijing's practices. What do you think Trump got, the Trump administration got right, and what do you think they got wrong? So I think that it's um, become a commonly accepted part of the policy conversation um, that um, the Trump administration, um, including my predecessor, Bob Lighthizer, uh, who, who um, uh, is very smart, um, really uh, put their finger on a diagnosis that there's something significantly out of whack and out of balance in the US trade relationship with China. And I think that you know, there's a lot of focus uh, from uh, the Trump administration on the trade balance. Um, I think that the trade balance is not everything. It is an important indicator. And I think it does show that um, out of balance nature uh, of our trading relationship. So I think that that's a really important thing, even through all of the emotion and drama of politics, to have a sobriety about diagnoses uh, so that you can have um, a serious and smart and strategic assessment of prescriptions for addressing what the problem and the challenge is. I like that phrase, sobriety of diagnosis. <laughs> so where do we go from here? There, there are some reports that there's arguments within the administration about whether to lift Trump era um, China tariffs. And, uh, and where, so tell, tell, maybe explain in basic terms, where are we with China today? Okay. Um, I think the relationship with China is, and this is, and this is not breaking news, so I apologize, because I know journalists always like breaking news. The, <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> the relationship with China is complicated. It's complicated. We're the two largest economies in the world. We matter to each other's economies, but uh, we matter to the, the economic prospects for the rest of the world. So how we manage this relationship is tremendously consequential to us, to our workers, to our producers um, uh, on both sides, but also uh, for the entire world. Uh, so it is really important for us to be deliberative about how we engage and manage this relationship. Um, I know there's a lot of swirl around the China tariffs. I'm gonna be really honest with all of you. I think that's the least interesting aspect of the management of our trade and economic relationship. What are the more interesting aspects? What I really want to highlight for you is that in terms of managing the challenge that we have, which is, which is one of um, competition and rivalry, there's also another uh, aspect of the need for cooperation, especially in those areas that affect all of us. Um, but in terms of the, um, uh, the competition and rivalry and the, um, the need to bring better balance to the relationship, tariffs are a tool. I know there's a lot of drama and emotion around tariffs too, but from, take it from your trade representative. Tariffs are a tool. <laughs> and uh, objectively, we have relied on tariffs for a long time as a um, playing field leveler as a remedy for unfair trade. Um, in that sense, tariffs are a really important tool of defense. It's a defensive tool 
you're trying to use the tariffs to um, um, counterbalance uh, the advantages that have come from unfair trading practices. The more interesting question is, if you're in a competition, aside from having a defense, what is your offense? And I think that this is where the Biden administration has really distinguished itself. Because our offense in terms of balancing out this relationship and in this global competition takes the form of investments that we are making in ourselves, in our infrastructure, in um, uh, chips and science and R&D, and in the clean technologies that we are going to need in order to meet the challenges of uh, technological advancement and uh, the uh, urgent need to uh, respond and adapt to climate change. So that's the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, that's the Chips and Science Act, that's the Inflation Reduction Act. When you take the two together, what you see from the Biden administration is both a strategy that involves defense and most importantly, offense. So I've heard what you've said about tariffs and at the risk of, of, of pressing a, um, an issue that you consider an, unimportant, how useful a tool are they defensively? Even if they are a defensive tool, are they a useful defensive tool or are they a not useful defensive tool? Um, it's all about how you use them. And if you use them smartly, if you use them with the goal in mind of addressing unfairness to uh, leveling the playing field, then um, they're absolutely useful. And what in your mind are the most important offensive moves we can engage in? You listed a bunch, but which, which, which to you is truly critical? Or is it the whole package together? In terms of uh, the offense yes. game? Yes. Uh, I, think it's, I think it's all of it. I think it's, um, uh, um, in terms of investments, uh, you've seen the signature investments uh, from this administration. And I'll say something that might be a little controversial because maybe not everybody agrees with it, which is that uh, these investments are extremely important. And um, the second part is they are a good first step that in order to continue to invigorate and strengthen the US economy, we need to do more investing in ourselves, and that includes investing in our people, that includes investing in parts of our economy that are critical to uh, broadening participation, like uh, the care economy and our care workers, um, but uh, that um, uh, our work is not done. Uh, and that uh, there's more that we need to do uh, to build our economy, as the president likes to say, uh, from the middle out and from the bottom up, to really revitalize and reinvigorate access to economic opportunity here at home. So you mentioned the CHIPS Act, which I think is an incredibly and critical piece of, of, of what, what has happened. But how far, can it, how far can it go? How much can it actually accomplish? And how much do we need it to accomplish? And what I, what I mean by that is that over the last few decades, in part due to this emphasis on profit maximization, semiconductor manufacturing companies have increasingly outsourced manufacturing to Taiwan, most not notably TSMC. And it is at least investors would say it's almost impossible for the US to catch up. Even the CHIPS Act money is a bucket, or is, is a small drop in the bucket compared to the amount that TSMC can, can invest. How important is that? How close do we need to get? Or how far do we need to get? So I'll take your question and I'll take the, uh, the CHIPS piece as a starting off point. Okay. Um, I think that TSMC and its, um, its creation and evolution is not an accident. Oh. And, I, and I, I don't even think that it's necessarily um, just a product of profit maximization from our perspective. Um, there was a concerted effort to invest in that industry and to grow that capability in that economy. So I think in a way, you know, the question you ask is a good one in this sense. Um, have we got it right? 
are we doing it perfectly? I think that we are getting it right. I think that we have not um, uh, achieved perfection. And so when I say that the investments that we've made are a really important first step, it's a recognition that we need to continue to invest in ourselves, but we also need to continue to figure out how to do this better. In essence, what you're seeing is the creation of a new and uniquely American kind of industrial strategy and industrial policy. And I think that it is new for us. It is American in the sense that you do see more of the government intervention in these industries, but that we are still intervening in a way where we are relying on market forces to create the incentives for our market participants to respond. And I think that there is definitely room in these areas for us to be able to figure out how to use these tools better, to make them more true to our economic principles and values, and um, uh, to, to figure out also how to do it constructively and cooperatively with our trading partners. Because it is true that uh, no economy is an island anymore. And so in terms of uh, succeeding in building out our middle class, creating more economic opportunity here at home, creating quality jobs, especially in the just transition, uh, what we're really going to need to figure out how to do is how do we do these things together with other countries? Because it turns out that I think in my conversations and everything I've learned in uh, doing trade negotiations and showing up for these uh, trade meetings, that we all want the same thing. We all want to be able to provide for our people, our workers, and to build out our respective middle classes. How do you think about that balance between what might have been, and I might be overstating it a little bit, but maybe the old world view of trade as you do what you're great at, I'll do what I'm great at, and this is just natural market forces will dictate who does what they're great at. And then what we see with some of the, the challenge posed by, for example, Taiwan's huge investment in its semiconductor manufacturing and the, the, the um, the success of, of government intervention. And so is there a clean model that you can use to think about um, th that old world view of, of we'll all do what we're best at and it will all work out and this more new world view of government can put its thumb on the scales? Well, again, right, um, what I'm talking about is um, government putting its thumb on the scales to respond to external stimuli. And uh, I think that the topic of our talk really makes multiple references to this uh, concept of free trade. Yep. Right? And one of the important things to recognize is that there is actually no such thing as free trade. Pure free trade doesn't actually exist. It's an idea yeah. and it's an ideal, right? And so we talked a little bit earlier about that uh, uh, David Ricardo model that is so simple and elegant and really effective in um, uh, uh, highlighting a concept of uh, comparative advantage and efficiency and kind of win-win outcomes. But uh, when you apply it to the real world, it turns out that all of our economies are really much more complex. And um, we don't each make one thing that we then trade. We actually all make a lot of things. And um, I think maybe one way to illustrate how if you take that simple model and push it to its extreme, the logic breaks down is uh, I've definitely heard people say, well, you know, there are a lot of labor intensive, um, uh, uh, input intensive industries um, that have left the shores of the United States um, that won't come back and shouldn't come back because uh, we have uh, high labor costs and we have high material costs, and that's not what we're good at, and we just shouldn't do those things anymore. Yeah. The issue is that we're actually still the world's largest economy. We have 330, 350 million people. Um, by that logic, should, should our goal be, should the result of this version of globalization be that the United States becomes an economy of 330 million artificial intelligence software engineers? It's not possible, and I think actually it's not even desirable, right? We have a responsibility to the diversity of our population. 
and the diversity of abilities and the diversity of talents and dispositions to provide for a diversity of opportunities. And so if you take that as your grounding principle, then I think that there are a lot of these elegant but too simple models and premises that we're going to have to wean ourselves off of. Very difficult to wean yourself off of an appealing model, isn't it? <laughs> they, tend, they tend to harden. So how, what are the challenges posed by China's current economic struggles? I was looking at a tweet thread from a, a, a Council on Foreign Relations member named Brad Setzer, and he said, not everyone recognizes that China is more reliant on global demand to support its manufacturing output than it was five years ago. And there's this idea out there that China is now using an export glut in order to, in order to uh, fight its own economic slowdown. I would think that that makes trade policy much more challenging, but maybe, does it? I don't know if it makes it more challenging. I think that it reinforces why it is challenging. And by the way, I'm just going to shout out Brad Setzer. Yeah. At the beginning of this ad administration for the first year, Brad Setzer was on my team as my counselor. Uh, and he is, um, uh, he is really, really smart. Um, and uh, I, I, whenever Brad says something uh, and when he tweets something, uh, I always listen and I think is, um, it, it's very valuable to engage with Brad's observations. So I think in terms of um, this tweet thread, uh, I did see it earlier today, uh, and I think that the value of that tweet thread is to make us um, uh, appreciate better uh, why we have the lopsided relationship that we have and to think through how we navigate um, maybe the incentives and tendencies that we may see in our trading partner uh, in this period of um, economic uh, dynamism and volatility worldwide and also within our economies. Um, I do know that there is very vibrant and robust um, policy debate and conversation about uh, how China's economy can become more of a consumer-based economy, less of a savings economy, less of an export-driven economy. And I think that that is something that um, uh, better economists than I am, and frankly, I'm not an economist, uh, but that the smartest economists um, uh, are engaging in thinking through. There was a headline in The Economist recently that China risks setting off another trade war because of its, because of its current policies, this, this export-driven uh, export um, 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 policy. Do you worry about that? Um, do I worry about it? Uh, there are lots of things that I'm worried about. Me too. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, the sustainability of um, the current trading regime, um, uh, because I, I think that it's hit uh, a lot of limits. Um, yes, I worry about it, but that also reinforces for me all the reasons why we're trying to uh, change the conversation, uh, change the exercise, and to advance positive change in the system. Yeah, I, I, I thought it ties in interestingly to your comments about, about steel workers and, and, and workers because part of what China is doing, it seems to me, may make that a little bit more challenging to enact policies that are fair to workers here. So in order to not be solely focused on China, um, we, can, we, can broaden out, we can broaden out beyond that. Do you, do you feel like we are too monomaniacal about China and that there are plenty of other issues in the world of trade that are every bit as interesting and important? Look, I think that this uh, question of the US trade and economic relationship with China is a really, really important one. Um, it's not the only one. Uh, so. Um, I don't want to downplay the significance of the issue, but I'm definitely looking forward to other questions. <laughs> <laughs> before, 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 we, before we move on, uh, I would like to just give you the opportunity to say what is important. What, what, if you could change the relationship with China, or if you could accomplish one thing in your remaining term to change our dynamic with China, what would that be? Hmm. Um, actually, I answered the question this way. I think that. Um, uh, I think that everyone should be deeply invested in the U.S.-China trade relationship being on better terms um, and uh, um, uh, finding balance and uh, better understanding. 
Um, I think that's going to take a little while. And so I don't know if there's just one thing, but I think what I would say is I really do hope that um, the United States and China continue to work on this relationship. So you said recently, I think it was recently at an Axios conference, um, you said the world feels like it keeps getting more and more complex. Mm -hmm. What's the key for all of us, for you and trade, for trade policy in navigating that increase in complexity? Oh, what's the key in navigating the complexity? I think it's um, to be unflinchingly honest when we look at everything going on around us and the world to not stick our heads in the sand, to not pretend that things that are there are not there, to not pretend that things are concerning or not concerning, and to really take on the challenges head on, uh, even when it's scary, even when it's inconvenient. Um, because I think that whether it's in our personal lives or in navigating uh, national and international economic policy, it's really, really important to be honest with yourself and with the others that you have to work with. I was going to say that that's wonderful advice, both for trade policy and for a life well lived, right? <laughs> so let's go back to that comment you made about McDonald's and that old uh, theory that if there were a McDonald's in two countries, they would, they, would, they would never go to war. How much does what's happened between Russia and Ukraine um, upend accepted, <laughs> accepted wisdom about trade making the world more safe? I think that it's, um, uh, it's, really, it's really important in terms of causing all of us to take another look at the assumptions that we've made. Uh, I think hmm, we can debate this because I know that there are lots of smart people here and that uh, I was told the University of Chicago is about um, uh, theory and concepts. Uh, you know, whether peace is necessary for prosperity uh, or prosperity is necessary for peace? That's an interesting question. And I think between those two, I, my gut is that um, peace is probably more necessary pro for prosperity than prosperity is for peace. Um, and um, it turns out that just trading a lot with each other and having a lot of economic dependencies, I don't think is enough to guarantee peace. I th and I, I, again, rem remember, I'm not, I'm not trained as an economist. Me neither. I, I'm, also, I'm also not trained as a, as a foreign policy expert either, right? But I, my, my issue area exists at the intersection of these two very powerful disciplines. Um, but from what I perceive, um, Vladimir Putin's decision to invade Ukraine was not an economic decision. And so, in, in many ways then, that decision was made despite the economics and the economic repercussions, many of which were entirely predictable in terms of the impacts on um, energy markets and food security. So I think that that's something that we really have to recognize, that at the end of the day, we're all human beings. We are more than calculators and accountants and uh, our economies are more than ledgers. Yeah, I love that way of thinking about it, that there's a limit to what economics will show you about the world, because the world is still driven by emotion to, to, to a large degree, and emotion is not really accounted for in many, in many economic models. So we're going to move to audience Q&A in about five minutes, so please start thinking about your questions and lining up with whatever questions you have. But I wanted to, to, to touch on before we go to Q&A, and we don't have much time, but, but, but the TPP, both the history of it and where we, are, where we are now. So maybe start with a little bit of the history of it and the, the, the fight over it in the Obama administration and where that's gotten us to today. Okay. Not China, see? Um, <laughs> true, true, true. Uh, yes. Um, well, but this one's a big one because it's also a history lesson. I, I know. Yeah. So, That's what um, I find fascinating about it. It is actually. really interesting. So the TPP stands for the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And um, it has roots in um, a, a negotiation. I think it was initially called the P4. And it was four countries in uh, the um, Asia Pacific. Um, we uh, eventually um, uh, joined, and then it expanded out. More countries joined. 
so that in um, the latter part of the Obama administration, there were 12 countries total. Um, I'm not going to test myself in rattling them all off, but uh, Australia, New Zealand, you had Chile, Peru, uh, US, Mexico, and Canada, um, Japan, uh, Vietnam, Malaysia, Brunei, I don't know if I've got all 12 at that point, but you, 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 oh, um, you, you get the idea, Singapore. Um, and, uh, you know, it, 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 it was on the trajectory of the types of trade agreements that we were pursuing uh, probably since the NAFTA in 1993, 1994. So these trade agreements got bigger and bigger. Um, they uh, oh, had big tariff liberalization components, but they expanded out to what we call in trade terms rules. Um, so uh, rules on um, uh, regulation, when governments can regulate, when they can't, how they can regulate in lots and lots of different areas, including uh, intellectual property. Yeah. But uh, according to US practice, they also involved uh, labor and environmental provisions. Um, it's a really big agreement. Yeah. Uh, and I think that one of the, um, uh, the, the you know, uh, repeated talking points at the time was, I think that when you took the TPP all together, uh, the countries represented 30% of global GDP. Um, the TPP uh, concluded in terms of the negotiations in October of 2015. And then it was signed, I think it was in February of 2016. And then the question was, in an election year, uh, could the United States get the TPP through Congress? Um, and um, at that point, I had moved from being a USTR trade litigator to uh, being a congressional trade staffer in the House of Representatives working for the uh, Ways and Means, the House Democrats. And uh, it was a rough time. It was a rough time because uh, this particular uh, policy initiative really split Democrats. And um, it was a hard time working in the Democratic caucus. Uh, so uh, there was a lot of um, uh, labor resistance, concerns about tying our economy closer to some um, less developed, very competitive economies, and what that would do in terms of displacing industries and jobs. Uh, resistance from certain industries also that felt very much in the crosshairs that they would be losing out. Um, but at the same time, you had um, overall an agricultural lobby that was very, very excited because uh, this represented opening into markets that um, have been relatively closed to US agricultural exports. So this, this equation was splitting Democrats from each other but it was also splitting American industries too, pitting, pitting sectors against each other. Um, in November of 2016, Donald Trump is elected president. Donald Trump uh, campaigned on um, a um, antipathy to these types of deals. And in the first days of his presidency, President Trump, a Republican president, a very unique Republican president, withdrew the United States from the TPP agreement. And that's where we are. The other 11 countries have moved on. Uh, they're still in the process of, um, uh, uh, I guess, um, bringing it into force amongst those 11. Um, and for us, to think that the lesson that I've really carried from that experience of seeing it negotiated, being a part of the swirl of uh, internal conflict around it, and then also now, it's uh, early 2024, so it's been seven years now, thinking about um, how we can do things better. And it's another, it's another indication that we should do things differently. That the withdrawal from TPP was significantly disappointing to um, those sectors of the American economy who felt like they were going to have benefits from it. That the negotiation of the TPP, if you go back further, was significantly hurtful and disappointing to segments of our economy who felt like the final product 
was not going to benefit them at all. And then on the foreign policy context, our withdrawal from that agreement was also hurtful and disappointing to all of those trading partners who had also spent years negotiating that exercise with us. And from my perspective, I think that to do better by our stakeholders, our workers, our farmers, to do better by our trading partners, we need to work on new modes of doing trade in a way that we are um, uh, cutting more in on a better deal uh, and um, not pitting ourselves against ourselves or against our trading partners. There's so much more to talk about here, but let's go to audience Q&A. And I'll apologize, the lights are right in my eyes, so you're just going to have to start talking <laughs> because I can't see. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming, Ambassador Tai. My name is Aaron Weinberg. I'm a fourth year in the college. And you're going to have to forgive me, but we're at the University of Chicago. I'm going to bring up Milton Friedman. In his essay on the case for free trade, he brings up that exports are the price we pay for imports. And you've discussed how you've advocated for steel workers and American workers in your role as trade and ambassador. But when you're talking about tariffs and you're talking about your relationships with other countries in uh, free trade, how do you view your role as an advocate for the American consumer that is coming under increasing um, pressures from price increases that many argue are coming from rising wages and worker shortages? Thank you so much. Thank you. You've got a voice that's great for radio. I'm really, I'm really um, uh, admiring. Um, so could you repeat the quote? Exports are the, the price for imports. Are you sure it's not the other way around? I'm just um, thinking through the logic. Is it that imports are the price for exports? Here, I actually have the excerpt okay. uh, exactly right here. Our gain from foreign trade is what we import. Exports are the price we pay to get imports. Oh, OK. Oh. Um, that's a really interesting logic. I will, uh, I will, I will take that link if you give it to me to read read it in full. Um, but the case for trade and you know our our free trade enthusiasts will say um, ninety five percent of the world's consumers live outside our borders. So um, all of the opportunities in, ter in terms of exporting to them. Uh, come from doing these free trade agreements where we can have more access to those markets. Um, what is interesting about that is that um, when we do a big free trade agreement, we're also lowering barriers into our market and we are liberalizing and uh, uh, facilitating more imports. If you look at the profile of the US economy, it is true that 95% of the world's consumers live outside our borders, which means that we are only 5% of the world's consumers. At the same time, we are about a third of the purchasing power and the consumer power in the global economy. And if you look at it that way, I think that our argument for free trade has been exactly flipped on its head. If we understand, and this is true for every negotiator, and I, I, I am convinced that everything in life is a negotiation. You just, have to, you just have to understand that dynamic. The most important thing in a negotiation is to understand what your power is. As an economy, our power is in our consumption and in our desirability to others as a destination for their exports. And so I think that that also informs how we should think about how we should do trade differently and how we should uh, arrive at um, trade relationships and a trade approach that is better for the American economy and creates more opportunities here. So I haven't quite engaged with your argument because I'm gonna go back, I promise you I'll go back and I will take a look at um, uh, that particular argument. But um, let me take the other piece of where you know, the, um, the Friedman philosophy has taken us uh, which is, um, you know, to, to pursue this idea of free trade very, very avidly. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, thank you so much for being here. My name is Maxim. I'm a third year economics student here at, uh, in college, and I'm from Ukraine originally. Um, you talked a little bit about this, but um, I wanted to expand on the topic of 
using trade to promote peace and democracy in the world, because that was basically the strategy of the West for the past few decades. And as you mentioned, it didn't quite work out when keeping deterring Russia from uh, using aggression against other countries. So now that we know that that strategy doesn't quite work, how do you see these two concepts, trade and peace, interact in the future? Do we just use trade as a sort of punishment against those who use aggression? How do you see those two interacting? So um, let me tweak a little bit your formulation, which is using trade to um, establish peace and prosperity. I, I think in terms of my comments, it was using trade liberalization as a way of accomplishing those things. Um, trade is a tool set. I definitely don't exclude the possibility. In fact, I embrace the possibility that there are ways that we can engage in trade and to harness the tools of trade, which is you know, uh, economic cooperation, um, uh, the terms of economic exchange, to promote democracy and peace and prosperity. And I think that that's where the question is, which is how you make trade a part of the solution, which means that it can't all be about liberalization because we've seen that that hasn't given us the results that we want. So um, how can we approach trade in a different way? How can we use trade tools in a way that reinforces democratic principles, more economic opportunity, and peace? Thank you. Hi, Ambassador. My name is Seth Poling. I'm a second year at the college studying political science. Thank you for being here. Just had a quick question about strategic competition between the U.S. and China mm -hmm. and trade between the U.S. and its key partners in the Indo-Pacific, like Japan, Korea, uh, Taiwan, and then also Europe. Um, what is technology, uh, what role does technology play in that, those trading relationships and how important is technology to um, the future of our economy? Great. I mean, I think technology is so important, not just to the future of our economy, but the future for all of us and our, our, our lived experience, right? So uh, your question's really, really very interesting. Uh, let me break it down this way. When you talk about technology, we probably mean a lot of different things. We can mean technology in terms of the goods that uh, contain technology, or the goods that are important to the infrastructure that allow for technology to um, operate. Uh, technology could also be a service in terms of knowledge, um, the pursuit of research and scientific advancement. So that would get us into thinking about technology through the lens of, and this is you know, wonky trade speak, but trade in goods, trade in services. And then increasingly, I think that we are thinking about technology as something on its own, something that's fueled by data. Uh, if we look at AI, uh, something that is um, uh, made possible through uh, computing power. Um, uh, and um, uh, that is challenging us to think about how trade connects with this uh, aspect of technology because it doesn't have a, a necessarily a corollary in our traditional mode of trade and goods and trade and services. So um, it's a wonderfully complex question that you've just asked, and I think my answer is just going to be uh, there are traditional ways that we can address technology and trade, um, but there are also, I think, uh, uh, a development of a new way of thinking about and approaching technology through trade that um, we are just starting to uh, scratch the surface of. Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you for coming to speak with us. My name is Julian. I'm a first year at the college. Um, as you know, your office is bringing an international trade complaint against Mexico under the USMCA for uh, regulating the sale of genetically engineered corn. Um, my question is, don't your actions interfere with Mexico's right to regulate? And as long as Mexico isn't discriminating against US corn, uh, why can't it regulate how it wants? OK, great question. This is another good um, uh, trade basics question. Um, so uh, your question uh, demonstrates that uh, you appreciate that uh, the fundamental principles underlying our trade rules is um, uh, non-discrimination. 
right? Um, so non-discrimination as between your goods and um, uh, imported goods, goods from another country, and non-discrimination as between uh, goods from one country and another country. Um, our trade agreements have actually become much, much more complex and far-reaching. And they're not without controversy, so let me just start with that. But in terms of the trade complaint that we've brought against Mexico, it's not actually based on a discrimination complaint. The complaint is that Mexico's regulations are not based on science. And so the question that's presented in Mexico's uh, decree is um, in regulating against uh, the import of genetically modified white corn that goes into human consumption, uh, what is the justification for Mexico um, making this decree? Is there a scientific reason? Can Mexico show that there is something somehow unsafe about this corn vis-a-vis -vis yellow corn, for example, that comes in for animal feed? And I think that's at the center of the dispute, but it does really highlight uh, the extent to which trade agreements go beyond some of our basic principles and um, encompass additional principles that have consequences on the right to regulate. Uh, Mexico, uh, they've been cultivating corn for hundreds, if not thousands of years, and it's very important culturally to the cuisine and just in general. Is a uh, cultural justification not enough to justify the regulation? So because it's a trade agreement, and this is where I can say I'm not an economist, but I am a lawyer, <laughs> you look at the commitments that Mexico signed up for in the agreement, and they were, uh, we're we, promise not to, we promise not to regulate arbitrarily. We promise to regulate within these parameters. One is that when it comes to food safety, that um, what we do will be based on standards, international standards, and it will be based on science. Um, our trade agreements do recognize that trade is not the end-all be-all. And there are exceptions written in that recognize that there, there are. And uh, there can be larger legitimate public interest and regulatory uh, uh, governmental prerogatives that uh, would justify deviating from your, uh, your, uh, your trade commitments. Um, um, I think that on that basis, the question around um, culture uh, is on Mexico to advance as a defense. Thank you. Thank you. When the U.S. was on board with TPP, part of its concept was to use admission as an incentive to open up markets, and especially in relation to state-owned enterprises so that China might qualify. Now I understand both the PRC and Taiwan have applied to enter the TPP. So uh, wouldn't it be good for the U.S. also to get in there so it can uh, mix it up with this diplomacy, and especially uh, to uh, push back against what seems to be Xi Jinping's strategy to cut off Taiwan's external relations. So to be in the game here, being a part of that would be very important. So there are a number of uh, dots that you've connected, which um, I have heard before, so I'm glad that you've posed the question. Um, I think there's a fundamental question about um, the guts inside of the TPP. And um, uh, what a trade agreement like that would actually do economically, geoeconomically, and geostrategically. So uh, I think that that's not necessarily a settled question. The, the second part is a little bit, mm, maybe I can do a big picture um, uh, engagement with, which is you said, wouldn't it be great for the US to go back to TPP? I think what I would say to you is, uh, if, I'm, if, if I put myself in a place where I'm agnostic about whether what the rest of your logic holds, um, my judgment as the United States Trade Representative today in 2024 is that the political equation for US participation in the TPP has not fundamentally changed from where it was in 2016 and 2017. And so um, uh, I think that that is an incredibly important
important part of the conversation for all of us to appreciate and absorb. Good evening, Ambassador. Thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Derek. I'm a first year graduate student at the School of Public Policy. Um, I enjoyed our discussion earlier about the complexities and increasing complexities of the world economy, especially as it pertains to trade. Among those complexities is logistics. I think we've seen, perhaps even in the Red Sea, the Houthi rebels, um, the Panama Canal and droughts that are drying up the canal itself. These logistics are posing more and more problems in the world uh, economy. What is the United States' role, perhaps, as an expectation from the global economy to solve these problems or to be participatory mm -hmm. in solving these problems? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think there's an aspect of your question that raises a foreign policy question. Um, and on that one, um, I'll say um, probably my foreign policy colleagues will give you a more interesting answer. Um, but. <coughs> What I will say in response to your question is, yes, I also see a challenge with respect to logistics. Um, in fact, a lot of the supply chain disruptions that we experienced through the pandemic were logistical challenges. So uh, one, of the, one of the ways that we grapple with this question at USTR is, um, how do we solve for, how do we promote more resilience in the way that global trade works. And um, uh, there are a couple answers to this, and we've developed our own terminology around this. Uh, one aspect is reshoring or onshoring, that is looking at you know, US um, manufacturing capabilities and recognizing that um, we could do with uh, uh, increasing those capabilities to a certain critical level. We can argue about what that level is, but it's an important conversation. One aspect is friendshoring, and that is um, entering into uh, agreements or understandings with um, those trading partners who, in a pinch, you trust will be there for you because you share values or you have shared interests. And then the third one is nearshoring, right? Slightly different from friendshoring where um, you will be relying on, if there's a supply chain in a distant part of the world or a set of logistics um, that start to become snarled, uh, that there are supply chains that are nearby uh, in your neighborhood uh, that can continue to work and to supply. And it's essentially a, a, a regionalization argument I think in terms of advancing more resilient global trade patterns, uh, we as the United States are going to need to um, incentivize reshoring, friendshoring, and nearshoring. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Ambassador Tai. Um, my name is Lafonte Brooks, first year grad student at the Harris School of Public Policy and uh, former Hill staffer with Congressman Horsford when he was on Ways and Means oh, as well. Hello. Uh, but I'm going to switch to a different region and kind of go to Africa a little bit and just wondering if you can share what is uh, the United States outlook on trade relations, particularly with Eastern African countries. Um, so just in general, if, if yep. you're able to sort of shed a little bit of light on, on any trade relations conversations that are taking place yes. with those countries. Yes. Thank you. That's a great question. I'm so glad you asked it. Um, I went to, uh, let me think, just last year, I, I went to uh, the continent twice. And uh, in, my, in my time so far, I've been three times. I've been to Kenya twice and once to South Africa. So uh, in terms of um, our, our trade engagements with Africa, there is a foundational trade program that we have with Sub-Saharan Africa called the African Growth and Opportunity Act. And this is a real uh, pride and joy of the United States Congress. Uh, it was brought into being in the early 2000s. Uh, it's a traditional trade preference program, but it is uh, probably of our trade preference programs uh, as of now, uh, the most enhanced trade preference program. Uh, so trade preference program is a program where we, the United States, uh, identify a number of um, 
uh, sectors uh, and a bunch of tariff lines where we're going to lower the tariffs for a set of developing country partners uh, attached to criteria as long as they respect the rule of law, that they uh, respect and work to improve uh, human rights, um, the respect for uh, worker rights, uh, and so forth. There's a set of criteria. And the concept is by uh, providing these unilateral tariff preferences, we provide these developing country partners with incentives for um, stimulating uh, trade and investment in the sectors where these preferences exist in terms of coming into our, our market. Um, AGOA, uh, this version of AGOA was renewed in 2015 for 10 years. It expires uh, next September, September 30th. And so there is a, a lively and active conversation with the AGOA beneficiaries around their desire to have this program extended. And also with the United States Congress, who holds the pen uh, and the power to reauthorize the program around um, uh, what a reauthorization might look like for how long and how that program might be updated to reflect updated realities on the African continent since 2000 and since 2015. We are also pursuing a trade uh, negotiation with uh, Kenya in East Africa. It's called the Strategic Trade and Investment Partnership. It is one of our uh, new uh, trade arrangements where um, we are taking uh, some traditional elements from uh, our past trade practice. We are injecting some new elements of our trade practice that are addressing um, challenges uh, and interests that we both share, for instance, on inclusivity. Um, from the African perspective, uh, as part of the African free, uh, African continental free trade area, uh, this emphasis on bringing women and youth into the economy and economic participation. And um, it's, uh, it's an engagement that we intend to build out over time to respect the um, level of advancement of the Kenyan economy which is uh, uh, middle income and uh, coming up on graduation from AGOA, with an eye also towards how we can engage with and enhance our economic relationship with specific African countries without disrupting the overall continental project of increased integration just between the countries on the continent themselves. So it's something we think about a lot President Biden uh, invited all of the African leaders to a summit in December of 2022. His instruction to all of us on his team afterwards was uh, engage, build partnerships, go to Africa early and often. That is exactly what we're doing. But if you look at the demographics of Africa, um, by 2050, 2050, one in four people on this earth will be African. And it is an incredibly young population. And I think the proposition for all of us to think about is how can we advance better, more um, uh, modern partnerships with the countries and economies in Africa to help to harness and unleash this potential? And most importantly, how can we do it in a way that reflects 2024, the 21st century, and the need to come up with truly post-colonial patterns of partnership between advanced economies and developing economies. And having that conversation is something that I'm tremendously excited about. And I think that it is the key to a successful evolution into a new version of globalization. Thank you. I'm so sorry. I think it's time. The screen is yelling at me to wrap up, so I'm going to obey it. Um, thank you so much for the sage words about uh, trade and about life and for reminding us that the set of tools we have to address trade may be prosaic, but the reality is anything but. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>